they say that any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. I've also heard them say, whoever they are, that any landing that you can walk away from where you didn't pee your pants or crap your drawers is an excellent landing. However, it's generally expected that uh, you're able to reuse the airplane after you've made your landing. Welcome. Meet Mr. Kelly Trimble. Please check out the ad for this channel at the end of the video. Don't ignore the on-screen comments and imagery scattered throughout this video as they are sometimes an integral part of the story being told and not just corrections. Here is Kelly Trimble. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the Aviation Content Creators Award event in, I think it was Rock Falls, Illinois. The airport was KSQI, and I talked about that a little bit in the last the first part of this. I was only there for like three hours on Friday of a three-day Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. And the big day was actually Saturday. Well, as it turns out, the really big day was Saturday because the big event that everybody remembers from that event happened on Saturday. I had, I had a day job thing in Peoria that I needed to do on a family thing that I went and did afterwards and got back, did day job stuff all day Saturday, and then I was going to I was going to do my report videos on a trip to Gimlin Airport the next evening. And right around 7 or 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock or so, right about the time they were doing the big awards dinner, I was doing my report videos and I was having all kinds of snafus with cameras and audio and stuff and on the way up there when I was filming part one the rear facing camera facing me wasn't working and then on the way back neither camera worked well I was able to kind of sort of salvage the part one but I knew I was gonna have to redo part two and which I wasn't happy with part two anyway, so what the hell. Well, okay, so I had something else happen the next day. Wasn't happy with, I, I went up flying and decided to remake the, the report video and it didn't really work. And I had a couple of business trips. I had to go to Houston, Missouri, miserable trip. Didn't like how it turned out. Went to Mountain View, Missouri, didn't like how it turned out. And then here two or three days ago, I went to Salem, Missouri, and I thought that'd be a good time to do it. And then I had people come going with me, and so and then on the way back we ran into some weather and stuff, and it just wasn't practical to do anything. But in in the uh, intervening time frame, a lot has come out about what was happening there. There was, in case you haven't heard, that whole event it seems to be organized or ramrodded at least by a guy named Dan Greider. Runs a, runs a channel called Probable Cause, a very popular channel. And while he was there, he was doing, I guess, some instructing. He was flying with somebody in their 150. And something happened and ended up upside down in a cornfield. Of course, everyone's got their opinions, but that was the big event. And when I was doing part one, I was not really aware that that had happened. I was kind of aware that, yeah, something happened, somebody crashed. I didn't know what the details were. A lot else, a lot more has come out since then. And you can't hardly report on. A ACA of 2021 without saying something about that crash or mishap or whatever you want to characterize it. So anyway, basically what happened now, if you, you can search it and find all the, the images you have. I don't have any images of it because I don't own any, any of them. I'm not going to steal them from somebody else's site without talking to them. And I, haven't, I don't know any of these guys. But apparently there's some guy had just got this 150. It looked like it had beautiful paint and interior. I don't know anything about the physical condition of, the, of it other than it looks like the flaps didn't work right, which is not really that uncommon on that particular plane. I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, seems they were coming in full flaps, two guys, sizable guys, in a Cessna 150 on a 95 degree, very humid day. And I'm not sure, but I think they were trying to line up on a 400 foot field, uh, which that plane really requires a little bit more than 400 feet to land on. You can kind of almost do it, but eh, not really. You sure as hell can't get back out. So it's like I think they knew they were going to go around, and when they went to go around, they had full flaps, and it wasn't able to perform. Now, they were trying to gain altitude, they couldn't, and they knew they were going to crash, and apparently went in under control. And from all the accounts that we have, it looks like Dan Ryder was the guy in the right seat that was actually manhandling the air, aircraft uh, and I guess set it down in this corner field uh, the wheel hooked on something and flipped it over they said it didn't do much damage to the plane but I look at it and eh, I think that plane's a goner but we'll see but anyway so 
Uh, everybody's got opinions. Of course, Dan Greider is the one that gets on. As soon as there's been a big crash, he gets on and says, yeah, these pilots were assholes, or they didn't know what they are doing, or uh, they shouldn't have been in that type of airplane, or they did this or they did that. It's pretty obvious what happened. And uh, uh, He has a lot of opinions on various crashes. He's the big safety guy about how you should train people and all this stuff. So some people would say that it was kind of, I guess you might say, karma that he's the one that crashed. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I would put it that way. Bad things happen to good people. And there is one observation, two observations I'd make. The first one is something that apparently in the aftermath of this, Dan Greider has been claiming all along, and I think he's right about it. I have owned several 150s. I own one at the moment. I'm getting ready to buy two more. Long story why, and I'm not, I, I don't do instructing. I don't run a flight school. I use them for aerial work and for some short travel. And right now I've been using this 182 to do some travel that I would be doing in a 150 right now. It's economical and, and it just works for some places I need to go. So I've got a lot of time in them. I don't know, maybe five, 600 hours, which is a little unusual for somebody who doesn't do a lot of instructing. Over the years of, I don't know, 20 some odd years, I guess my first flight was in a 150 in the mid-70s sometime, been flying them for a while. You learn a lot of the peculiarities about them, and I've done some research about them. I, one of the, I thought I might even do a YouTube video about what kills people in a Cessna 150. Well, I'll tell you what kills people in a Cessna 150. What people do in a 150, they, you don't see these happen as much in other airplanes. What do they do in 150s and kill themselves? Well, it's uh, basically buzzing. Some guy just gets his license, he's got five hours, he goes out, decides he's going to impress his friends, his neighbors, his parents, his whatever, girlfriend, and he goes and buzzes their house, and he pulls up, and he looks back at them, and stall and spin. Or they're coming in for a landing, they do base to final turn wrong, they stall and spin. They, they go to land, they decide to go around, they're trying to keep it tight or whatever, it gets too slow and too tight, and stall and spin. Or they have some sort of an engine failure, and they don't quite plan right, and they decide they're going to try to make the next little cornfield or whatever, and they pull it back, and they keep it trying to keep trying to get it, keep it to fly, and then it stalls and spin. Or they run out of gas, and they don't quite make it somewhere and they stall and spin. It's actually relatively rare for a Cessna 150 to actually go in under control and everyone survives. They almost always stall and spin. They do it 50 feet above the ground, 200 yards short of the airport half the time. You read the accident reports from the NTSB on all of them. There's some surprising stuff. I remember one I was reading. I went through the list and there's one uh, Cessna 150 fatalities on the aircraft three and well I thought you know it's a two-seat airplane you know what the hell? And I thought, you know, there's some that they had like this little child seat thing in the back seat, maybe they kind of, uh, maybe they, they croaked a kid or whatever. No, you could read it. Dumbass gets his license. He's like, uh, has like five hours after his check ride. He decides he and two of his drunken ass buddies get in a Cessna 150. There's three of them in this 150. And they decide to go buzz a marina some, and they stall and spin right into a bunch of boats and kill everybody, burn up the airplane. But what usually happens, though, what you see in the aftermath of the crash of a Cessna 150, you don't see it upside down in a cornfield on one piece with people walking away from it. What you usually see is a ball of shrapnel, a ball of aluminum with an engine and a couple of dead bodies inside of it. It hits the ground, rolls, and it just turns to pieces, and it's all wrapped up in a nice little ball. And they have to kind of peel all the, the stuff off of it to get to the innards when they go to investigate it. That doesn't seem to be what happened here. So I'm going to hand it to Mr. Greider for keeping his head cool when he knew it was going in. And it did seem to take, and this is something I talk about in another video somewhere, it did seem to take a second or two for them to get their head around the idea that they were going to be making a forced landing. You know, you can argue as to, you know, how long did that take and did they really do that right or whatever. But, he, you know, he knew he was going in. He knew it wasn't going to make the field. And he played it the best he could and forced landed into a field and, yeah, okay, flipped over. It came close to staying right, but nobody died. I think he got like a hangnail when he got out or something. I mean, that's the only injury. So it's like nobody even got injured. Airplanes uh, really smacked up, it looks like, in my opinion, but eh, they think they're going to repair it. So, eh, we'll see. I'm sure it's going to be all over the tube every step they take to, to do it. And, and it seems, though, on some of the, the websites out there, I've heard, I've not actually seen this, but he's been accused of doing this purposely in order to get publicity. Yeah, I don't really seem to do that. Nobody would do that, I wouldn't think unless you're a real dumbass. One thing my dad used to always say, any publicity is good publicity, and sometimes your bad publicity is the best publicity. Anyway, the other observation I would have about that, the only real criticism I would have of it is the chain of decisions that, and what they were doing, that put them into the position where they're going to be doing a go-around where something could go wrong. 
Now, in my experience, I've got more experience with Cessna with a wide variety of Cessna 150s, scattered from late 50s clear up to end of production. There was a run of them where they had electric flaps. You had basically like four settings, 10, 20, 30, 40 degrees. You'd click to a setting and the motor would run it to that setting. I'm not sure why, but it seemed like if they were going to stick, they were going to stick in the 40 degree down position. You know, my theory was that a hot day, you're wanting to drag it in on the flaps to land short or to do something or whatever, and you run them all the way down. When it gets toward the bottom, it's really working to make the last little bit, and the motor overheats, and then kind of sticks there for a little while. You go to put them back up, and they don't. And now, the other thing about that is, there is a run of those Cessna 150s where they they actually did a 40 degree flat position. I think over the years they discovered that it wasn't real practical. It didn't really do that much for you. It did slow you down, but it, but it just made it awfully hard to fly and do anything with. It was hard to go around when it was in that 40 degree position. So I think the last bunch of, of 150s that they made didn't go down the 40 degrees. And I think the people that flew them a lot kind of knew that you didn't put them all the way down to 40 degrees until you knew you were going to hit the pavement. Because because you didn't, didn't count on doing a, a go around with the 40 degrees flaps because it was just so hard to get them back up and, it, and it's, it's kind of a pucker time to try to get, get it to do a go around with 40 degrees flaps. And that's something that maybe Mr. Greider didn't know and maybe the guy who had just bought the 150 didn't know about that particular make of a 150 which isn't that uncommon. Mr. Greider, I don't know that much about him. I did talk to his son there for a while and gave me some rundown. I guess he was a corporate guy. Flew corporate for somebody, I think down here somewhere, flew Delta or somebody for a lot of years, and he's got this DC-3, so he, he flies big stuff. I don't know how many million hours he's got. I'm sure he's got tens of thousands of hours, you know, but uh, uh, it's not uncommon for somebody who is a big deal pilot to come down to your local airport and flies uh, 172 and run it off the end of the runway or something. I mean, that's kind of a common thing, and it happens a lot. You know, a lot of times I'll get, I'll be in this 182, and I'll get some, uh, I don't know, some corporate guy, uh, some King Air driver get into this thing and he decided he's going to show me how to land it and we're, we're full of gas and, and two people and so we're forward CG, comes in to land, he can't quite flare it because he's, he's not trimmed all the way back. He lands on the nose wheel and he hits the brakes and flat spots the tires and you can't hear it and I'm just seeing the smoke trail off the left wheel and I know it's going to be another $300 tire and you can't say nothing or they come in and they stall it six feet off of the ground and it hits and it, it starts bouncing and porpoising all over the place and you're thinking, oh shit, this is going to be a firewall now. You know, and, and you can't say nothing because this guy's got 12,000 hours or something. All the cachet and all the, that goes along with that. And, you know, there's a lot of times I'll get some, and this is another common one, you'll get some bizjet guy get in like your Bonanza or a Baron or a Debonair or something like that. Something kind of kind of slick, but not something that you can just manhandle around of the pattern. And you'll have them land it, they'll fly the pattern, and they'll fly this bomber pattern or whatever. And for some reason, guys that do business, jet, and especially like like uh, military guys fly jets, somehow they always smurf the smeg out of the turn based upon, and they'll overshoot it. And I don't know why, it's common as hell. And it's really kind of, you, you just want to snicker, but you can't. But, you know, guys with these tons of experience and they all over the world and they've flown everything and, you know, they get something small and simple and they, they smurf something real bad. Usually it's pretty harmless and, it, you know, you, you, you can't say anything. You just got to bite your lip. The, it's kind of a joke. The BizJet biz guys, I don't know what the, the dynamic is because you wouldn't think they'd do it because in a BizJet, yeah, you plan your turn based on final two miles back uh, and they'll they'll overshoot it I don't know why common as hell and I kind of wonder Mr. Grider's flown all these big things big jets all this set house all this, his experience he, he may have instructed in 150s all the time for all I know and he may know, may know more than what I'm thinking but I'm thinking big time pilot gets in a Cessna 150 he doesn't know anything about uh, he doesn't know that plane he's never flown that plane before the guy who he's riding with doesn't know anything about it and they decide, I think they were trying to approach, they had this like 400 foot runway they were, that they had done for the stole competition or something that they had. I think they lined up on it to see if what it would look like to land short or something. 
and then either planned not to or decided at the last minute that they weren't going to land on it. So they put the flaps all the way down, and yeah, magically they stuck. That happened to me a time or two on one. I had it all the way down. I knew it was going to land. I was trying to make the first intersection out here so I was landing short. So I had them all the way down, and pulled off the runway, went to put them up, and they didn't come up right, right immediately. Waited a few minutes and turned the plane off. Went back later, and they came back up. And I always like kind of theorized that maybe the switch was dirty, maybe it overheated the electric motor. The 150 I have now is an early straight tail that has the big cranky handle for the for the flaps, and I really like that. But except you have to really kind of crank on it if you're going real fast. If you're right up the top of the wide arc, you, you, yeah, you, you get some barbell experience there. But the conditions, I've not really had anyone talk about the actual conditions. Uh, Two guys, they don't even have to be real big guys, with any gas at all, in a Cessna 150, or 152, I don't know, it's somewhere around in there, on a brutally hot day. Now, when I was up there the previous day, um, I was there on Friday, supposedly it was hotter on Saturday, but when I was there on Friday, I mean, it was real humid, and it was real hot, it was like 96 degrees, full humidity and all that. I don't know how hot it was on Saturday when this happened. I think it was supposed to have been slightly hotter, a degree or so hotter than what it was on Friday. And when I was there on Friday, it was really hot and it was humid. I mean, I got a free sedatio testiclectomy out of it. It was it was that miserable. Just soaked my shirt. I wish I'd had another shirt. The only thing I had with me was a sweater of all things to change into. But two guys with some amount of gas in a Cessna 150 that apparently neither one had had a whole lot of experience in that specific airplane and they decided to do some short field thing and I kind of if I were to criticize Mr. Greider at all it would be something about what led to the decisions to try to do that and were they really cognizant of what the capabilities of the airplane were in order to do a go around were they really aware that you don't use 40 degrees flaps at least it's a common practice, uh, best practice in that airplane. Don't use 40 degrees flaps until you know you're going to be on the pavement. Maybe, maybe not. That's the only thing I criticize him for, but I would hand it to him that they're not both dead because of how they handled the putting it down. Anyway, that was the big event of the whole thing on Saturday. Yeah, they had an air show. Yeah, they had a, a run up and down the runway. And then they had the awards banquet later, and they did this and that, and then, and then. But everyone's making the YouTube videos about Dan Greider's crash. When I was there, Mr. Greider was one of the people I was kind of wanting to talk to. I only got to talk to Mr. Greider very briefly. I was kind of wanting to talk to him, and I had reasons I was going to that thing. He was doing a radio interview with somebody, and I took a couple of photos of it. I may have distracted him when he was talking, so later I said, Hey, I took your photo, I hope you don't mind. He was like, cool with that. Did happen to catch him for just a few seconds as he went by. Talked to him briefly, and, oh yeah, hi, I'm Kelly Trimble, introduced myself. And so I got on the subject, yeah, you know, you, yeah, you seem to have a thing about the NTSB, and he kind of went off on that for a second. I, I was like... I think I said, you've got a case of the ass against the NTSB for some reason. He seemed puzzled like he didn't understand what that expression meant. Maybe, maybe I don't But he went off on the NTSB and for a minute, for maybe 30 seconds. And that's not really what I was wanting to talk to him about. And he, was, he needed to be somewhere else. So I, I kind of let him go at that point. And, uh, there's another young guy in a red t-shirt of some sort, ACA shirt. Looked like he was staff or something, but I started talking to him. Real, uh, real interesting young guy. Turns out he was that—that that was Dan Greider's son. Told me some about Mr. Greider's background and stuff. And after a few minutes, Mr. Greider came by and snagged him because they had to go do something and so on. But that's the extent of my interaction with Mr. Greider at the place. And that's kind of similar with a few other people. I was kind of wanting to talk to Brian Taylor. I knew he was going to be the MC of the thing. Uh, he got a ride in the. I think it was the Lockheed Electra, which, by the way, was a beautiful airplane. Pointed out that it was the Model 12. I was wondering why it didn't look like Amelia Earhart's airplane. And I talked to the guy who owned it, and he kind of explained that his was a Model 12, and Amelia Earhart's was a Model 10. And I guess I knew that from when I was a kid and read about all that stuff. There was, There has been a Model 12 that flew here into Point Lookout back 20-some years ago, and I took a bunch of pictures of it back then. I don't know if it was the same airplane. It has the same, same kind of paint scheme on it and saw the same plane down at Fayetteville once, I believe. So I've seen it a couple of times, and I think somebody explained that to me before, but the Model 10 had a different canopy or a nose or something, and it just 
was not as attractive an airplane as the Model 12, which this guy had. And he had the aluminum all polished, and it just glistened in the sun. It just almost make your eyes hurt to look at the thing. Boy, it was beautiful. I, I was able to climb in there, and man, the interior is just beautiful. The panel is wonderful. I mean, it's just dreamy. If, I don't know if you've ever flown a big multi-engine tail dragger or not, but yeah, I mean, they make this big old loud radial noise, and that uh, boy, just everything rumbles. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm sure the DC-3 makes a bigger noise, but this one, I would think, was not quite the same production to get in the air as the DC-3 would have been. It's more of a personal aircraft, I would think. The DC-3 is almost, I don't know if it's supposed to be a two-pilot operation, but, man, it works better with two pilots. I was totally blown away by this Electra. That's kind of like my kind of airplane. If my dad was still around, he he would have he would have been all over that thing. I mean, it was it was it was that cool. It was a really cool airplane. Anyway, so Brian Taylor was going up in a fl- uh, a flight in that thing and flew around. And I guess the the little RV guys were all forming forming on him. They had this big giant formation going or something. I think. And I know they did that with the DC three or whatever. Anyway, so the Electra pulls up. These guys get out. Brian Taylor gets out, and it's like it's like any air show. It's hot. There's no shade anywhere, and everybody finds the wing of the biggest airplane out there, and everyone puts their lawn chairs under the the wing of the big airplane. So there's there seven or eight lawn chairs, people kind of congregating under the right wing of Dan Greider's DC-3. Brian Taylor walks over there, and I kind of walk over. And I was getting ready to say hi to him or something, but he was kind of mobbed by people, and he was. He was shucking and jiving with one or two other YouTubers who I kind of sort of recognized and so on. And that's kind of when I realized that, you know, all these YouTube guys all kind of know each other. And I'm kind of the odd man out. And I just need to sit there and listen. Anyway, so he was kind of the center of attention there. And kind of, it kind of uh, dawned on me that, yeah, this guy's kind of the celebrity here. Uh, he's 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 kind of the big deal here. And I thought, well, okay, I'll do the paparazzi thing. And I did click, 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 click. I took a bunch of photos of him. I thought that was kind of neat. But... Uh, and then I thought, what am I going to do with these pictures of Brian Taylor? Yeah, oh, well. Anyway, sometime thereafter, they did, They had this, like, building or hut or something that was like the VIP center. They had one of these uh, orange chain-link plastic fence things around it to kind of keep the public out of it. And that's where the real YouTubers were. He went into there, and I was able to get his attention for a second and just introduce myself. I, you know, Hi, I'm Kelly Trimble. I'm from Branson, Missouri. And he's like, oh, yeah, Branson, I flew right over. And he saw the upside-down building and... I figured, well, if he saw that and he was headed northwest, he would have, you know, a mile later, he'd have flown right over my my house. You know, what are the chances of that? That's kind of neat. But other than that, I didn't have any really any interaction with him. One thing I did miss, apparently the guy, the Belancaro Channel guy, was there. Had the opportunity to talk to him and everything. But I had, as dumb as it sounds, I'd never seen any of his videos. I never saw his channel before did not know who he was. You know, it's not kind of like Elvis walks up and introduces himself, and I'm like, yeah, he's another guitar player. Yeah, he, he was a bona fide big deal. I didn't know it. I didn't talk to him. He was just another one of the also random YouTubers that were running around the place. And I thought, okay, he's a guy who's got like, you know, 200 subscribers or something, or, you know, a couple of thousand subscribers. I didn't know he had a quarter of a million subscribers. Everybody listened to him. So I missed out on that. Talked to a lot of different guys. The Flywire guy, it's like I kind of knew who he was. I hadn't watched a lot of his stuff. I watched some, but I was talking to the guy with the P-51. Never really got back to the Flywire guy. I kind of wish I had. I kind of wish I'd gotten to know. So I kind of wish I'd gotten to know some of these guys, but but no, they apparently they've known each other for years. They all know each other. It's all a big community, and they are their own community. And yeah, I'm wondering, you know, do I really want to break into that or whatever? But one of the objectives I had to to be in there was to try to connect up with some sort of YouTube corporate people who might be giving, you know, that might give some actual advice on what they're really looking for. And I didn't see any of those people there. Maybe they were there on Saturday. I didn't see them on Friday. I didn't see anything, unless they were in the, the VIP thing. So I, I guess I kind of missed that. But anyway, so that trip, that part, I mean, that was my main reason for going on that and I didn't get that so I guess the trip was a bust in that regard but I did get to meet a lot of the big aviation YouTubers. Kind of neat. What else did I do there? They had several food trucks. When I was there on Friday they weren't all open. They had this one thing doing like funnel cakes and uh, I don't remember what else but it was all sugar and carbs and, and 
stuff that was going to put me to sleep when I was leaving, so I, I just skipped that. But they pointed over to another thing that did a barbecue thing. They had a barbecue sandwich and this and that, but they had brisket. They really seemed to be proud of the brisket. And they had, two, they had like fatty brisket, lean brisket, and I didn't know which one I wanted. They said, okay, well, they said, here, try both. So they gave me a big piece of the fatty brisket and kind of a piece of the lean brisket. And I paid it $12, and it was $12. Oh, my God. I mean, it was good. It was really good. I mean, I, I walked around there and just, uh, God, I mean, just my fingers were greasy. I didn't care. And it was, I, I don't know, maybe it was the heat. Maybe it was the fact I hadn't eaten all day. I don't know why, but I thought that was some of the best beef brisket I had ever had. I mean, it was really, really, really good. But it was $12 damn dollars for not very much. I mean, it was like country club pricing. Uh, wow, you know. But it was good. I had a cooler with my own soda, so I didn't buy a soda. Maybe they were mad at that. But did get to see a few other people. Kind of a shout-out to some people. There were a couple of guys in red T-shirts that were under a tent that got me to register for something. I filled out a card. I wasn't real sure if I was registering to win some sort of an electric tug or to be called by some insurance agent. Uh, one or the other, or maybe both. I'm not sure. But these guys had a cooler full of water. They were just, they were a lifesaver. I mean, they, they, I got two or three waters from them. They didn't ask anything for it. They were giving out swag, ba swag bags, I guess, to the YouTubers. And I'm not a real YouTuber, so I didn't get a swag bag. I can't report what was in it. Don't know anything about it. But those guys were really nice. I kind of enjoyed them. There was a guy, uh, some old guy, military guy, I guess. He'd been in the military. He had some medical thing. He wasn't flying anymore, if he ever flew. He had an OMD, an Olympus OMD camera, which when the OMD came out, I really wanted it really bad. Because when I was young, I had an OM-1 back in the 70s. It belonged to some famous photographer, and I ended up with it. I shot the crap out of that thing. I did a lot of photography on that thing. All black and white film, hand rolling the film and all that stuff. But all of the cool kids, all of the cool photography jocks, you know, at the school, they all had, all had Nikon Fs. And I wanted a Nikon F so bad, you know, but I had this little Olympus. Nowadays, I've got Nikon cameras. Yeah, I, they made this OMD, which is like a clone of the old OM-1. Looks like it, but it's a digital camera. I want one of them real bad. Anyway, this guy had one. Got to look at it a little bit. Got to talking to him. Normally, wouldn't have talked to him, I guess, but he gave me his life story and all that stuff. It was really interesting. It's kind of uh, so bad. Apparently, he had been to the one there the year before. I lived in Iowa or somewhere. I drive to Kansas. Drive to Illinois. Whatever. I mean, he was. He was. It was kind of his thing to go to these things. When I originally did the the second part of my report, basically, I was going to report flying to Gimlin. It's like 15 minutes to Gimlin. I ran over and I thought, okay, I'll report coming back but I screwed up the video on the way back and so when I redid it the next day I started talking about how when I was young I knew some Air Force guys that were working for us out at the farm learned that there was there was such a thing as call signs and they explained to me that you don't choose your cool call sign you get your call sign given to you by your buddies and it usually has something to do with the most embarrassing stupidest thing you ever did in the military when I was there I was talking to one of the RV guys the guy that had the RVA a that was similar to mine, and he was he was ex-Air Force, and you know, we kind of got on that conversation. I thought that was interesting, because the next day, Dan Greider did his thing, and I thought, well, okay, that's the kind of thing you would do in the military where you would get a call sign out of it, and so I thought, okay, what is Dan Greider's call sign going to be? Is it going to be Dan Greider call sign crash, Dan Greider call sign cornstalk, uh, whatever. Anyway, somewhere I picked up that he may have already been in the military. Some, some Someone said he, something about him being a colonel or something, but I don't know. Uh, maybe that's his new call sign, his colonel. Having to do, yeah, I don't know. Whatever. But it's not my position to be giving him a call sign, number one. That's something that his... Uh, the, the rest of the YouTube community should be doing for him, not me. And I think in the intervening time frame, there's been a lot of stuff out there where people are already doing that, and so I don't really need to add that. wasn't able to make that video, but I kind of mentioned that that's kind of what I was going to do. After the conversation with Mr. Greider uh, about the NDSB, I thought that was interesting that the next day I find out he, he has this incident, and I thought, well, okay, he gets to talk to the NDSB. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd kind of like to be a fly on the wall for that conversation, but... You know, you think, oh, that's going to be a bad karma. Well, no, the NTSB didn't really do anything to you. The FAA could do something to you. But the NTSB just reports and stuff. They take forever to report on things. 
Uh, sometimes they're thorough, sometimes they're not. I mean, we've all heard criticism of them. Uh, Mr. Grider's pretty hot on them, critical of them, and he may be right for all I know. So it looks like he may get to talk to him at some point about this thing. But if anybody does anything to him because of the chain of decisions that led to the incident, regardless of how he salvaged it and kept him from dying, you know, what should the FAA do about that if they decide that he did something wrong? Well, the FAA doesn't do anything if you do something wrong. They do something to you if you do something against the FARs. I'm not so intimately familiar with the FARs to know what, what they actually violated. Uh, they did something that's not really in the POH or, or what. I mean, it's something, eh, you know, what they were doing, a hot day, two people lining up on a 400-foot field, full flaps, and then trying to go around in that plane with my experience in it. It's not something I would have done, but it's not my place to really say that either. Uh, I don't know if there's anything in the manual that says thou shalt not try to, you know, shall not put 40 degrees of flaps in unless you know you're going to do something. But I don't know. It's like, well, if it turns out that he made some faulty decisions leading up to the the incident, uh, what should the FAA do about it? Well, you know, uh, people are going to be discussing that all over the place. And if they do something, it's just going to be sour grapes. And it seems like the FAA doesn't really care about that anymore. All they really care about right now, based on the thing that happened to the lady in Ohio, it sounds like they're more worried about what happens with your ADSB than they are anything actually safe, which I can talk about with my trip to Peoria. I do get, and I'm not wearing a hat, do get the probable cause hat. That, that was, a, And there was a Boncario hat for sale, too, and the guy tried to get me to buy that, and I was like, I never heard of it. But I bought the probable cause hat, and it was 20 bucks. I was like, holy crap, you know, well, okay, bald guys have hats, but I usually buy them 20 at a time at a garage sale somewhere. And I got boxes of hats, I got a thousand hats, and that's normal for a bald guy. Why would I pay $20 for a hat? Well, it was there. It's the only souvenir that I got, other than the $12 worth of beef brisket, I guess. So I got the hat. You know, it's not really a $20 hat. It's more like a $600 hat, because the gas up there in that barren was like $570-ish, I think, by the time I was done. Had the hat, yeah, you're pushing $600. But the hat, you know, it's like $20. Is that a lot? Well... Yeah, that was, what, 3 or 4% of the $600. So it's like, yeah, 20 bucks is a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, no, nah, it's not. But anyway, so uh, I got there around 3. I left about, probably about, I got a hold of my people in Peoria, decided to go ahead and leave, and hopped in the bear and took off. Went down to Lakin, Illinois. I forgot the name of the airport. They drove out and met me there, and we went to some country club thing. It was about a half-hour flight, I guess, all told. Uh, with climb out and circle and all that kind of shit. Went to some country club that was just down the street from the airport. Could almost walk there and had what had to have been the best prime rib I've had in a long, long time. Maybe I was just hungry and everything tastes good. It was it was really neat. It was very good. Met some family there. Uh, interacted with that when I was in SQI, when I was at the ACA event. Burned out the ox tanks. I had them top off the mains. I thought, you know, that should get me there. But by the time I flew down to Lake, I burned out a, it was like a 74 gallon. My experience has been burning around 23, 24 gallons an hour would give me about three hours. I figured it was two hours and 10 minutes or so back from Lake and back home. And I flew a half hour out of the little over three hours. It pushed me uh, two hours, 40 minutes, two hours, 45 minutes, maybe if I was lucky for what should be a two hour flight. It's probably going to be a 210 minute flight. And I was going to be doing it at night. Okay, I had like a real marginal, maybe I could argue that I have 45 minutes. Because I was doing the super economy saver, and the book says it's 19 or 20 gallons an hour, but I was not really getting that. You know, it's like, yeah, I could argue that I might have 45 minutes, which is the night VFR requirement. But, you know, it's night in a plane that I don't have a lot of experience with. Hot, hot summer evening Perfect, uh, uh, real, real dead stable air, except hot evening, sun going down, perfect conditions for pop-up thunderstorms. And I thought, the, uh, uh, it didn't really happen that night, but it happened like two or three nights later in that in that stretch. But I thought, you know, I get up, I get up, I got minimal fuel getting down there, I need to get some gas. So my original plan was, we do dinner, got there around 6.30, we do dinner, do whatever, I take off, and I'd go to... On the way back, I'd go to Jeff City and stop there and get some more gas. And I have, I'd have plenty to get to Jeff City with an hour and a half reserve. But I called Jeff City just to make sure. It turns out, no, they close at 9. I thought, yeah, I'm not making it there by 9. So I thought, well, okay, Columbia. Just 
just a little bit to the right of them. Well, yeah, they close at 9, but they have landing fees and they have handling fees and there's an on-call fee for the guys there and it takes forever for him to get there and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, well, no, it's gonna, we're not going to work. So I thought, okay, I'll just take off and I'll go down to Peoria, like 10 miles away, 15 miles away, something like that. But it's in class Charlie and I don't have ADSB on this airplane yet. So we go to dinner and while I'm at dinner, I plunk around my cell phone and I request a waiver through the, I forgot the name of the program, and I've done it before two or three times, request a waiver to get into Peoria for when I got done with dinner about an hour, hour and a half later, and it was denied. Uh, Friday night, nine o'clock, they decided for whatever reason not to allow me a waiver to get into Peoria, Illinois. I'm like, really? Uh, Peoria on a Friday night? is that busy uh, or I did something wrong. Now, no, know if you requested too much, they'll deny you. Uh, three or four weeks before that, I went to a thing in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, an art exhibit thing that I was exp- that I had to go to. Not really had to, I really enjoyed it, but planned it for one day, got the waiver, and got weathered out. Decided not to go, uh, and I don't really know how to cancel the waiver. I guess you just hold it and it expires or whatever. And like, uh, I don't know, a week later or two, three days later, whatever it was, I decided to go in the afternoon and got another, you know, applied for another waiver and got there, went into Little Rock. And I thought maybe, okay, I applied for a waiver twice in a row, two, three weeks before that, so maybe that, maybe that's too often. That's the only thing I could think of that was wrong. And then someone told me when I got back that maybe they did that because all the Oshkosh people were going into Wisconsin, filtered through there, and so they were just denying them. But, you know, when I went up there, uh, that's all I heard was guys who didn't have waivers calling up approach saying, uh, I need to go through the class, Charlie. I need to go over because can I, can you clear me over because blah, blah, blah. And you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to be able to do that. And, you know, I wasn't just going to take off and say, hey, can I come in your class, Charlie? And then them say no and then be stuck, you know, having to search all over Missouri for some place to get gas. Well, they had gas so you could get with a credit card there at Lake in Illinois. But I'd had a bad experience with uh, with a credit card thing way back years ago, and I just I've always shied away from doing that. Even if I pay more at the big city airport, I was wanting to go into Peoria. Anyway, so I take off from from Lake, and I I go ahead and top off the tanks with a credit card deal. Didn't like doing it. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm gonna get screwed again on it. Didn't it turned out okay? But maybe uh, maybe I'll warm up to it someday. Took off, headed due west. Called up approach, said, hey, can I get flight following to? Point look at PLK, uh, uh, Clark downtown Branson, Missouri. And they're like, yeah, we'll arrange that. And I climbed straight out and performance climb all the way up to trying to get like 8,500 feet going westbound to get over the little bit of clouds that are out there. So I'm going straight west uh, to go around the class Charlie. Oh, oh, and it was hazy. Oh my God, it was hazy. It, it had to be six, seven miles visibility. And I was climbing and all that. And I, you know, basically, I went, I, I, it, it was the next thing to IMC. I mean, it was it was that bad. So I was kind of contact navigating too, calculating where I was supposed to be, stay out of the class Charlie. And I think I was about a mile and a half outside of it. Anyway, I went due west uh, instead of southwest. And the guy came, comes back saying, did you give me the right airport? I said, yeah, it's this is the identifier. And yeah. Well, he said, well, you're going the wrong way. I didn't know what sector to hand you off to. And I said, well, I'm going around your class Charlie. Uh, I don't have ADSB, and he, and he was like, "Well, you know, you could, you could kind of request and get into that." And I'm like, "Well, no, I was just denied. I'm not going to request it from the controllers and get violated or nothing." I, it sounds like you all are serious about it anymore, and you're denying people, and you're putting your your revoking people's thing because they turned their ADSB off and stuff. So yeah, I'm not going to screw with it. I went around it, and the guy kind of thought I was a dumbass for doing that. So I flying back. Got up 8,500, the cloud tops were coming up. So I went on up, requested higher, and they said, yeah, don't stay below 10,000. So I went up to 9,700, trimmed it all out. Man, it was just trimmed beautifully. The thing just hummed all the way back. Clouds kind of disappeared and I could see the ground. I had about 22, 23 miles of visibility. I mean, I knew exactly where the towns were and how far away they were. Flew all the way back at this weird altitude for a VFR thing, 9,700 feet going westbound not where you're supposed to be, but it was trimmed out. They didn't seem to care, and I didn't want to screw with it. I didn't want to try to descend and retrim everything. All the way back, beautiful textbook flight. Uh, started the descent about 35 miles out, slow descent, 400 foot a minute, landed, and it was totally dark. Oh, oh, full moon, full moon by the time we got back, but it was still real dark because it was so hazy. Textbook flight, beautiful, 
but I thought that was interesting that can't rely on being able to get a waiver into a Class Charlie. I haven't even tried a Class Bravo yet for the ADSB, which if you're planning a trip, you're not supposed to request it more than a day before you're going. So, you know, let's say you have a trip you want to do on Friday and it's t Monday or Tuesday and you need to go into something that has Class Charlie. You don't know if you're going to be able to get that waiver until the day before. And you're planning your whole week around maybe going to that thing on Friday. If it turns out you can't get your plane in there, it's a bust, you got to drive or do something else, and you need to know that on Monday. So I think it's kind of a screwed up system that way. I mean, they need to give us more guidance on when they're going to deny these these uh, waivers. It turns out, yeah, okay, I, I was able to work around it on not being able to go to Peoria, Illinois at 9 o'clock on a Friday. So I was able to work around it. It wasn't a big deal, but there's going to be times when it, it would be a big deal. And, you know, come to find out the day before the trip that, no, they don't give waivers to that. You know, and then have to drive all night to get somewhere. That, that could be a problem. I think they need to overhaul that and give some guidance, you know, something that says we don't give waivers into this place. You know, even if it was just because of Oshkosh, maybe they should have let everyone know we're not going to give you waivers into around the Class Charlies or through the Class Charlies if you're on your way to Oshkosh. But uh, anyway, that's a, I, I don't know, I've harped about ADSB before. I think it's a technology that's only going to last 10, 10, 15 years, which is the way, you know, we did encoding uh, altimeters 20 years ago. They were pretty simple, two, three, four hundred dollars. But this, you know, ADSBs, uh, yeah, you know, you got the wingtip things that are like a couple of grand. Well, yeah, they're a couple of grand for the part, and you put them in, and your plane's gone for an amount of time. You got to fly your plane to wherever the hell it is and arrange to get back, and so you got to screw with it. You lost the man hours and all this kind of stuff. So it's actually more than what that costs, and. You know, that's kind of like the light version of ADS-B out, is the wingtip things. I mean, if you decide to fly to Mexico or somewhere, or you sell it to somebody who's going to take it overseas or something, that thing's going to be worthless. And the real ADS-B out, eh, it's part of your panel, and it's more like three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000. You know, if you've got a whole bunch of airplanes like I do, times 5000 you know, I've been there. I've been on that rodeo before. I mean, we, I mean, we did Lorans. We bought two or three Lorans way back in the 80s. And yeah, they were kind of, they were several hundred dollars. Uh, they may have been a couple grand or whatever. GPS, and that's better. Okay, that can, we're like, yeah, okay, everything changes, kind of hurt, but we're getting GPS, which actually is better than the Lorans. And then they shut down all the Lorans, and all of our Lorans became junk. And I still got a Loran in the Belanca or something, I think, that still needs to be ripped out. So we do the GPSs. We got a bunch of Apollo 2001s, and we got MX-20s in like three planes. They're, those were like five or six thousand dollars a piece back around 2000 or something like that. Well, okay, the MX-20s work great. They're beautiful. Uh, the only problem is you can't get update cards for them anymore. Garmin quit updating them. Same thing with the 2001s. They'll still work for high-far approaches, but not without a current card. And the latest cards for them are 10 years ago old. So our experience is the new technologies they're coming out with for navigation and stuff in airplanes it's good for maybe 20 years. The updates are good for 10 years. There's going to be a point which they just quit, and when they quit supporting them, it's not going to work as well. And that technology is always changing, always getting better. There's going to be some new technology comes out where they're going to decide, yeah, ADSB is not really what we want. And they're going to come up with some new thing 10, 15, 20 years from now, and all your all of your ADSB stuff that you just bought is going to have to be ripped out and replaced with something else. Or it's going to be a mark of your airplane being really old and worthless. If it was two, three, four hundred dollars per, per plane to make it work, yeah, okay, that would hurt a little bit. We could stand that. But four or five thousand, and oh yeah, it's only a couple of thousand dollars? Bullshit. That's real money. I'm not made of money. I, yeah, I own a bunch of airplanes, but nah. Maybe they're denying waivers in the th into the rural airspace because they're trying to get people to do ADSB. The thing that happened to the lady in Ohio uh, flew under a bridge. Yeah, she should have got suspended. She should have got counseling or whatever, but they revoked everything from her. And she was like the, the queen of aviation in that part of Ohio. I, I don't know that much about her. Apparently, she has some fame or something with aviation. And they didn't, they didn't blink an eye at just revoking her because they, they think she turned her 
ADSB off because it was one of those wingtip deals that was wired into your nav flash and you, there's nav switch is still there or a breaker or something and you could turn it off. And she turned it off to fly under this bridge. And they think. She claims, well, it broke and it didn't really work. But they believe she turned it off, but they didn't really have proof of it. And they revoked her ass for it. So the FAA is getting really serious about ADSB. They're, they're saying, oh, you can get waivers, and they were nice about it for a while. It sounds like they're going to shut all that shit down. You know, Peoria, Illinois, 9 o'clock on a Friday, you can't get a waiver. Yeah, right. Uh, that's the hottest place in the Midwest, I'm sure. And there's so much traffic that they couldn't handle a ADSB not being there. I don't know what the real reason was, but but anyway, that's the report I have of that trip. Not much else to tell. The the main takeaway I got from the ACA event was that all of those YouTubers seem to know each other, and it's a group of YouTubers. And I don't know if I'm going to try to break into that. You know, it's like I didn't really want this to be an aviation channel anyway. Not totally convinced that that's where it's going to go and so I don't know that I really need to break into that community or not but it was interesting to go up to see them that was kind of my takeaway is how they they all seem to know each other and collaborate on stuff and everything and I'm not sure how that's going to change over the next few years but those guys have all been YouTubing for two three four years at least there was one guy Wolf something who's a new guy and I guess he's low time he's got couple hundred hours or something he flies himself around i don't know what he does where he can afford to do this but he's been he apparently went to the thing last year so he's been around for a year or two and he seemed to know everybody and he's a real gregarious guy and, and all that but he seemed to be the newest one everybody else seemed to know everybody for, for four five six years as far as i can tell but anyway that was my takeaway uh there is a community there and i'm not sure if i'm going to be in that or not but it was it was something worth going to it's kind of like being in the military once i've done it i've done it i'm glad i did it but i don't know that i want to do it again and like i say I, i've been to a thousand air shows it's hot it's miserable there's no shade yeah, you see the, the airplanes turn themselves inside out a number of times you get tired of it and i just want to get somewhere get back get my business done and all that i yeah not there to show off and stuff i've done enough of that so but uh, anyway that's what i have to report back at 2021 my opinions on dan Grider's crash uh, opinions are like uh buttholes everybody's got one and i've i've got one too worth about as much as anybody else's but uh, anyway that's what i got to report sorry for the really long video but youtube seems to like long videos these days this is one of the more boring ones but we'll see how this uh, works doing night flight in the 182 see if that comes out at all how i'm doing this i got a ring light that i used on an earlier video that reflected off of my glasses i'm trying to tilt the glasses to where it doesn't reflect and i've got it kind of propped up in the window it makes it a little hard to see out and but it's really super stable everything's trimmed out pretty good and i'm cooking right along headed back home after a long trip i really wasn't wanting to come back at night but here i am thought i would try this see if i got an image at all out of it and we'll try to put it together and see if we can make a better video than what i did last time but like i say i'm still learning this stuff kind of check things out check me out some more like subscribe whatever if you want to no youtube video is complete without somebody telling you to, to do that apparently anyway if you have any questions or comments put them in the comments below i'll try to respond to them as best i can i'll meet you on the next trip Congratulations on reaching the end of this video. We hope you have enjoyed this miserably long, rambling pointless rant by Mr. Kelly Trimble. We appreciate your patience and investment of your valuable time. But please, allow us an extra couple of minutes to promote the rest of the channel. Techno Nerd Math Boy Bluegrass Fan, Radio Jock and Professional Shutterbug. Applied Economist. Consultant, economic researcher, actuary, writer, and vocal opinionated community smeghead, trekker, and firm believer in the original ideals of the Jedi Knights in our current day passive rebellion against the Empire, domiciled in the American Midwest who also is an appraiser, broker, and dealer in interesting stuff like, commercial real estate, automobiles, airplanes, machinery, antiques, art, radios, stuff one shan't mention on YouTube, and sometimes just common junk, with a full restoration shop to play in. And plenty of unpopular opinions on a wide range of subjects, DIY tips, tutorials, and sometimes rambling pointless rants that go nowhere and generally smeg everybody off, usually perpetually contrary to conventional wisdom. There could be a lot of subjects explored on this channel as it develops, should it continue to develop, 
But since this is an aviation related video that you just watched, we would like to point out that Kelly is a private pilot, has several airplanes, some of them pretty interesting, has been flying for decades, with a modest amount of flying experience, in the low thousands of hours, but unlike a lot of the regular aviation YouTubers, aviation is not his day job. Kelly is not a high time career professional pilot, nor is he an instructor, though if asked, he is more than happy to explain to anyone just exactly how they should be operating their aircraft. He flies a lot for business, usually to remote and interesting places people sometimes need to travel to on business, hardly ever to anywhere glamorous. Kelly intends to upload videos of these business trips and talk about the economics and sociology of general aviation as part of this channel, and he has several interesting planes to talk about, so although this may or may not develop as a purely aviation channel, you may eventually encounter a lot of aviation related content here. If you should disagree with any statements or opinions Kelly enumerates or expresses in his videos, you can register your displeasure most effectively by telling him, and the entire world, all about it in the comments below. If it turns out you actually like the content, or god forbid actually agree with him on anything, you can explain that too. In which case you might also click the like button, subscribe, prompt for notifications, and you may thereby increase the probability of enjoying further content in the future. Please, enjoy the rest of the channel as it develops. If you have ideas on what direction Kelly should go with the channel, he would very much like to know. Even if said suggested direction you wish to encourage is intended to terminate in his own rectum, please feel free to pound that out on your keyboard in letters of flame in the comments below. Thank you for being so gracious to watch to the very end, or at least skipping to the end to peruse our modest ad. It may not be the shameless display of naked avaricious commerce of the ads that YouTube are likely to place at random points within Kelly's video over which he has no effective control, and for which he wishes to apologize if it interrupted either the joy of watching, or the accumulation of disgust or anger, but it is hoped that this ad is at least persuasive enough that you might feel compelled to check out Kelly's other videos as they are posted. But to do that, you will need to like and subscribe. At least one of the two boxes that YouTube should place at the end of this video should link you to another of Kelly's videos. Mr. Trimble would like to apologize for the lack of any suitable background music either within the body of the video or in this promotional announcement, but please understand that this channel has yet to be monetized, and Mr. Trimble, being the tightwad that he is, has yet to figure out how to obtain the rights to the use of such music for free. We appreciate your understanding. Thank you again for watching, thank you for commenting, and thank you for flaming, if that is your desire. And now, with Goofy's tail pointing up and Mickey Mouse's manhood pointing at 8, I now realize that my new platinum diamond faced sapphire studded Rolex Zenith Daytona Cosmograph is probably a total fake and that we've probably reached the end of the promo, so we will see you in the funny papers.